Our next guest, our next guest speaker, has worked closely with Unislim on their Forever Free plan. And she's going to be talking to you today about the myths of dieting. So this is definitely one where we'd like your questions at the end. I'm sure you're all going to have loads for her. So please welcome to the stage, Sarah Kyo. Hi, everybody. I think I know about half of you at this stage anyway. People here. Thanks very much for inviting me here today. Um, dying to talk to you about diet myths because I think it's something that comes up all the time when I'm dealing, whether I'm talking to groups or I'm talking to somebody one to one. And people come in to me and they say, Have you heard about the latest? Have you all done raspberry ketones? Lecithin, burns fat, all these different things. My, my line for a lot of these is really if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And you kind of know it, but I think we're very hopeful. So what I wanted to just run you through today was some of the myths that I would see quite a lot, um, talk you through what, we, how, you know, what they're for, what we're going to change, and what you can actually take as being real and what isn't. Um, I suppose the first one that I'm hearing all the time is, you know, the pasta makes you fat and carbs. And I suppose there's been such a big trend around cutting carbs. Everybody's on a high-protein diet or their low-carb diet or they're cutting carbs or bread is evil. Have you heard that one? And we hear so much of this, and I see people cutting them out, and it's such a pity. Carbs actually are an important food group for us. They are this part of our food that really provides us with energy. These are your fuel. And although your body can use protein for fuel, it can use fat for fuel. It really likes to use carbohydrate for fuel, and it's also the fuel your brain in particular likes. So we've been talking earlier in the day about motivation, mental health, getting ourselves up and running. You've got to look after your brain with your food as well, and a little bit of carbohydrate is actually very beneficial for that. What you get with the carbs if you go for the whole grain, do you know we talk about whole grain bread, whole grain pasta, this is where you start to pick up some of your B vitamins. Now the job for B vitamins, they help your body turn your food into energy, so this is crucial. B vitamins help to reduce tiredness, they reduce fatigue. So you know the day when you just don't feel like exercising or you're too tired, this is the time when you need your B vitamins in there. What you also get from your whole grain foods is your fiber. And fiber is an incredibly important part of a healthy diet. Women who eat cereal fiber, so fiber that comes from grains, fiber that comes from whole grain bread, they get 32% less bowel cancer, they get 52% less breast cancer, and um, we see less heart disease. They find it easier to be a healthy weight. Did you know that? Fiber helps you lose weight? It does. Fiber, when you eat a high fiber meal, the food stays for longer in your stomach, so it's longer before you get hungry. When you eat a high fiber meal, um, it actually encourages your body to burn fat rather than store it. Plus, if you eat a lot of fiber, you're going to lose 150 calories a day out. I know it's just after lunch, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So just by adding in your fiber, it makes it easier for you to be a healthy weight. So there's, and there's just so many reasons for making sure your fiber is in there. And your carbohydrate foods, like whole grain cereals and so on, are major sources of fiber in the diet. So it's something that you need to include. What we need to look at with carbs is the amount. How many of you ever get pasta, cover the whole thing, plate with pasta, and then put the rest of the dinner on top? You know, pasta should only be, you know, a quarter to a third of your plate. When people do say to me, does pasta not make you fat? I was like, well, it does if you eat four servings every time you sit down to it. That's going to do it, definitely. But if you have your carbs and you keep them in around a quarter of your plate, that's fine. You're going to get all the benefits from it, but you're not then going to overdo it. And that's the first thing to remember when it comes to the carbs. The next myth that we come, and I hear this a lot, is don't eat after seven or after eight or after six or whatever it is this week. So watch that. You know, the body doesn't magically store extra fat if you eat after seven o'clock at night. The reason that works is that a lot of people have dinner around six or seven, and then they sit on the couch eating chocolate for the rest of the evening. So yes, if you stop eating after seven, amazingly, you lose weight. But in terms of how your body handles fat, that doesn't happen if you're hungry. And that's the crucial thing. If it's a case that you're coming home from work late some evening and you're having your dinner at half eight, there's no reason to skip it. Have your meals. It's so important to actually get your nutrition and even for weight to eat your regular meals. Um, we need to fuel our bodies. And honest to God, there's no point trying to go to sleep hungry. Have you tried that? You don't sleep, and then you get up in the middle of the night and you have four packets of biscuits instead, okay? <laughs> Eat your dinner. What you want to do is just check in the evenings that you're hungry. What I find for an awful lot of people is we come in, we sit down in front of the TV, we're lovely and relaxed, and then after about half an hour, you're kind of getting twitchy and fidgety. Do you know that one? What do you all go and do? Yeah, put the kettle on. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this. If you're sitting in front of the TV and you start to get all agitated and fidgety, what is your body looking for? Exercise. Have any of you got a dog? 
You know, the dog is sitting there twidgety and agitated. You don't look at the dog and go, that thing needs chocolate. <laughs> what does the dog need? A walk. Humans are no different. If you're sitting twitchy and agitated in the evenings because you need to get up, get out and go for a walk, Ruth is going to be talking about running faster and all the rest later on. So it's movement. Once you've sat for more than 30 minutes, you're going to start fidgeting. It's a natural part of how the body works. So don't be eating in the evening just for the sake of it. But coming back to it, it's not that you don't eat because it's 7 o'clock. But don't eat if you're not hungry. And that's the question to ask. Am I hungry? If you are hungry, no problem, eat something. You're naturally going to get hungry every three or four hours anyway. So if you've had dinner at six, it would be quite normal for you to be hungry again at 10 o'clock. Now, it's not meaning you have to go out and have a three-course meal or anything, okay? But don't fight with it. If you're hungry, you're hungry, but if you're not, leave it be. The next myth that we're gonna have a look at then is the idea that healthy foods don't put on weight. I love this. You can eat on whatever plan, you can eat X amount of this, or Y. Eating fruit and veg, it'll be a long time putting on weight with that, but I do meet lots of people and they think that if anything is out there as a healthy food, that they can just go for it. And these are the people I meet and I'd say to them, look, a handful of nuts, nuts are really good, they're very healthy, really good food. And then they come in and eat two pounds of nuts in an evening and then they're wondering why they put on a stone at the end of the month. So just because a food is good for you, doesn't mean you can actually just go wild and eat absolutely loads of it. So portion sizes are always going to be important. We're quite good at talking about, you know, let's not eat a lot of the sort of the junk food, the treat foods, that we don't overeat on biscuits and cakes and all of that sort of thing. But when it comes to healthy foods, sometimes we don't think about the portion sizes with it. And that's why doing things like balancing your plate properly, that you have your carbs that are about a third of the plate. They're very healthy, but not if they're your entire meal. So the idea of just having a bowl of pasta and sauce for dinner isn't good. You need to have the balance with it. So just because a food is healthy doesn't mean you can go crazy with it. You just need to have the same sensible portions with it that you would with anything else. This is one of my favorites, that salad is always the right thing to do. Can you see this salad? I used to work over in a hospital in Glasnevin and every May, the nurses used to all go on a diet. And we had a fabulous, and I don't get to say it that often, we had a fabulous catering staff in the hospital. The food was fabulous. And they used to normally have the dinner, which was always really good. There was fish, there was rice, there was all sorts of vegetables and everything. But in May, they all went on the diet. So they swapped from having their really nice dinner, which might have come in at three, 400 calories, and they had salad. And they had pasta salad, potato salad, rice salad. <laughs> It was a big plate of salad, but it was an entire plate of carbs, so nobody ever lost any weight, because they also added in an apple and yogurt as well, because they were healthy. So suddenly they were eating about 700 calories. So salads can be brilliant, and they can be a great option, but you've got to look at what you're actually taking. Um, and that, like that, I, I'd have lots of clients who come in to me one-on-one, -on -one and they say, yes, I eat salad for lunch. And when I was a, a little novice dietitian, i go, that's great. Now I go, what's on it? What's in it? You know, if it's all kind of ham and cheese and egg and pasta, you're probably not going to lose all the weight in the world on that. So look at your salad should be raw vegetables. So it should be lots of things like you know, your tomatoes, your cucumber, all the different vegetables like that. And watch the dressings. Now, all the people who tell me they hate salads, they either hate lettuce, which is what Irish people think a salad is, is lettuce and tomatoes. There are other things you can eat. Um, or they don't use a good dressing on it. And that's actually something worth hunting down. A, a plain, dry salad has to be one of the most boring things that you can eat. But if you go and find a good salad dressing, and I mean, low-fat ones are good, and you can get some tasty ones, but even a small amount of a high-fat one, if you keep it really small, can actually be fabulous. And there's loads of other ways of flavoring foods to, look, you know, to, to get it in there. Um, put flavor onto your salads, because then you'll actually eat more of them, you'll enjoy them. So that's important to do. So just keep an eye, when you're, when you're going for your salad, um, see exactly what you're putting on your plate. The other one is people thinking skipping meals loses weight. And I see this a lot with people, particularly people who've struggled for a long time with their weight. Very often they don't eat breakfast. And there can be several reasons for that, but very often what's going on in the back of their head is, I don't feel hungry in the morning, so I can actually skip this meal. And they think, great, that's another couple of hundred calories I haven't eaten, and they think, brilliant. But it, unfortunately, it doesn't work. As soon as you start skipping meals, missing meals, the body goes into starvation mode. The body needs to be fed, it wants to be fed. If you don't feed it, it doesn't understand that you don't feel like it. It doesn't understand that you're choosing not to. All it knows is it didn't get fed, and the body's quite simple. It just says, well, if I'm not getting fed, it must be a famine. 
So I've got to stock up. I've got to slow down the metabolism to hold on to what I've got. And then when you do eat later, I'm going to store more of it in case there's another famine tomorrow. And what you'll find is that by skipping meals, you'll actually add weight over the years. I'll never forget working with a, a young guy and his older sister had sort of dragged him into me. He said he's kind of basically living on two sandwiches a day. He'd lost a lot of weight and was so terrified of putting it back on. But he just, he'd brought his metabolism down so slow, we were able to actually treble the amount of food he was eating without him putting on weight. Now, don't try that at home, okay? <laughs> I'm not suggesting if you increase the amount of food you're eating, but it was just, when you really starve yourself, the body goes into starvation mode, and it's not healthy. And what you'll also find is if you do that often enough, you're just going to go crazy later and eat a huge amount. One of the things that when you look at how the human brain is set up, do you know when you, have you ever seen pictures of the brain? I think it's kind of gray and lumpy. But the inside of it, there's like a white thing that's shaped like your fist, okay? That's what they often call a very old part of our brain. They often call it the reptilian brain. So it's been with us for an awfully long time. And although the gray part of our brain, that's what we might call it our willpower. That's where we can make decisions about stuff. That can be 100% overruled by the white part of the brain. And that's the part of the brain that's around instincts. Um, I think the best way I ever heard it described was, um, if I told you you held your breath for 10 minutes, I was going to give you a million euro. Could you hold your breath for 10 minutes? You should try it. At some point, no matter how much the willpower is, you are going to breathe. So there's parts of your brain that just take over. If you go long enough without food, if you get hungry enough, it doesn't matter what your willpower is, at some point you are going to eat. And usually by the time you get that hungry, you don't go for salad, okay? You go for? biscuits, chocolate, crisps. You go for the highest calorie food available. And then, of course, you spend the next two days giving out to yourself because you did something that was actually perfectly normal. So you're far better off to eat your regular meals, have your breakfast, have your lunch, have your dinner. And to include those, you won't actually lose weight by skipping them. You might need to reduce the portions on them. You might need to adjust what you're actually eating, but don't skip the meal. You need at least three meals a day, and most people need a snack as well. The last of the myths that I'm going to look at today is the one about sugar. And this has, to be honest, been breaking my heart over the last year because there's been the huge thing about sugar last year. And every, every bit of sugar is terrible and it's wrong and we should never touch it and it causes cancer and heart disease and blah, blah, blah. First of all, sugar itself, there's actually almost no evidence, practically none, that says sugar itself causes cancer. What we know is that if you become obese from eating sugar, the obesity is linked with the cancer. But no different than if you become obese from eating too much fat or you become obese from eating too much carbohydrate. It's the obesity that we know is linked to the cancer, not the sugar itself. And it's a terrible pity because what I'm finding is people cutting out very healthy foods just because they have sugar in them. The first thing to remember about sugar is that 80% of the sugar that we eat is found in foods that we know very well are high in sugar. So soft drinks, we know they've got sugar in them. Biscuits, cakes, chocolates, sweets. 80% of our sugar is from places we can really see. We talk about hidden sugar. Have you heard this term? As if the manufacturers are kind of behind the door shoveling it in and not telling you. Like, it's on the label. Okay, it's often on the front of the label in a little red sign if it's there as well. The sugar is there, but the amounts is what you really want to look at. We talk about some of the soft drinks can have anything up to 21 teaspoons of sugar in a bottle of soft drink. Okay, that's quite a lot. And then people say to me, oh, yogurts. Have any of you given up eating yogurts recently because of the sugar? I meet loads of people doing that. And it's like, there might be two or three teaspoons of sugar in a yogurt. Half of that is the natural milk sugar, the lactose. And then there's a little bit more in it. I met a woman recently who only eats half an apple at lunchtime and the other half at dinner time because there's lots of sugar in it. You're like, there's two teaspoons of sugar in an apple, okay? And it takes your body four hours to digest it anyway. So it's not about that. You don't cut out healthy foods. The bit of sugar in an apple or a yogurt or something like that, please don't even worry about it. If you're going to look at sugar, you want to look at sugar in the big sugary foods and maybe lessen it down from there. But there's often lots of other reasons to cut those out. The other thing to watch with sugar is, I see lots of people and they're like, I don't eat sugar, I only take honey. Or I don't take honey, I only use agave syrup. Or my favorite in the States at the moment is dehydrated cane juice. <laughs> I don't know how they ever had the face to put that on a label somewhere. That's just sugar to everybody else. So it's just names for different things. Sugar is sugar is sugar. Whether it's honey, agave syrup, all the different variations of it, all of that has the same calories, and almost all of it has pretty much identical effects on the body. So if you're cutting sugar, cut sugar. Don't be cutting it out and swapping it for something else that's the same thing. Okay, and don't be worrying about the bit of sugar in a tin of beans or the bit of sugar in an apple or the bit of sugar in a, in a yogurt or something like that. It's absolutely fine. So what can we do? 
So what do we do to actually get it right? Now there's any number of different ways of losing weight. Most of it comes down to what a doctor actually said to me years ago. He said, you need to exercise the body more and the mouth less. <laughs> I thought, God, it would be great if that was simple. We just stick it on a poster somewhere, we'd be grand. So there are things to do. And I mean, I could talk all day on this, but what I want to talk about is just a couple of things around simple habits. And one is to balance your plate. And this is one of the easiest things to do. When you look at your plate for lunch and dinner, it should look like this. About a quarter of it should be your carb foods. And ideally something like, you know, if it's whole grain if possible. So keep that to a quarter of the plate. The next chunk then is you need some protein in there. So we all, it's really good to get a bit of protein at lunch and dinner. It helps the body, just for good nutrition anyway, but it helps to satisfy the appetite quite a lot. And then the rest of the plate is salad or veg. And there's a million different ways of actually putting that onto it. So a little bit of dressings, flavor it up, you know, get a lot of variety in there. Go for stuff in season. It makes a huge difference to what you actually eat. Have you had a tomato that was homegrown ever? You know the flavor out of that? I remember when we were kids, one of my friends, um, their house used to back onto a field where the farmer was growing tomatoes. And in those days, cherry tomatoes were waste. Um, so he came in one day with this huge box of what, we, what he was called waste tomatoes. And the whole, there were six kids there, we ate them like sweets. Pop, pop, pop. They were gorgeous. Could you imagine kids doing that today? And it's just that if you taste a lot of cherry tomatoes, there's no, no flavor. So if you can look at what's got taste in it, you're encouraged to actually eat the food. And that's why we do talk a lot about food in season when we can get it. A, it's generally cheaper, but B, it tastes and the flavor is fantastic. So balance your plate. That's a very simple place to start and you're going to look at your weight. The other one is listen to your body. And this is a little bit, you've probably heard people talk about mindful eating. And that's kind of the difference between sitting at home and paying attention to what you're doing or going to the cinema and eating a giant bucket of popcorn and not even noticing it's gone because you're so engrossed in the movie that you're watching. So when I talk about listening to your body, one of the crucial things I would say is listen to whether or not you're hungry. The body's actually very, very good at giving you some indications around this. Now, before I get into this, remember I said always have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, okay? Don't skip meals. But um, you're all after your lunch now, are you? Okay, hands up anyone who's hungry. No takers. Who's definitely, definitely not hungry? Everyone else. And who's not sure? A couple of you. I would say if you're not sure, you're not hungry. Okay? Usually if, I, if there are hungry people and someone says, am I hungry? The hand goes up and then the head goes, God, am I actually hungry? Because the body kind of knows ahead of your brain. So you know when you're hungry. Now, I'm not talking faint with starvation, but you know when you're hungry. So... In between meals, it's really worth saying to yourself, am I hungry? Because we eat on automatic pilot quite a lot. And I meet so many people who actually eat very healthy breakfast, lunch, and dinners, but the reason that they're putting on quite a lot of weight is they're snacking in between meals when they don't need to. If you think about it, when you feel hungry, what does your body want you to do? Eat. If you are not hungry, what's your body telling you? Don't eat. Okay, if hungry means eat, not hungry means don't eat. And it is actually that simple. <laughs> Putting it into practice can be a bit of fun. But it's just in between meals, how often do you eat because it was there? Don't we do that? I love how Irish people do food a favor by eating it. <laughs> it was there, I had to eat it, you know. Um, you know, or we eat to be polite. I think we got such a laugh watching Father Ted when it was on and Mrs. Doyle, because we've all met her. You have to eat, and it's very rude to refuse. Or we eat because it's there, we eat because it's, we're being polite, we eat because we had a bad day, you know, all these different things. And you want to eat because you're hungry. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but in between meals, am I hungry? It's a great question to ask and a lovely thing to start listening to. The other one to do, though, is that when you're eating, have you ever noticed when you're eating that after a while you start to feel full? Yeah? You're all going, yes, but I usually ignore it. Um, when you start to feel full, that is your body telling you that you've eaten enough. It's a lovely inbuilt signal that we all have saying, done. Um, and it's really worth paying attention to. And if you do it for a couple of weeks, you'll get to know what's the right portion for you. Because sometimes we talk about portion sizes for different things. And as a general rule, they'd work for most of us, but we're individuals. And the amount of exercise we do will influence it. You know, how bigger we are, how much muscle we have, different things. So if you're halfway through a meal and your body's going, well, I'm starting to feel full, trust it, leave it, walk away. Okay? Do you think you could do that? Did anyone do it at lunchtime today? I should have come in and watched you. <laughs> Ideally, when you get up from the table, you should feel like you could fit a little bit more in. Okay? You should be 80% full. Okay? That's not hungry. You won't be hungry at that. You just won't be. You know, I think Billy Connolly puts it nicely. He says you couldn't wedge in an after eight. You know that <laughs> sort of feeling? You're all feeling like that now, are you? Okay. Should be a little bit of room. And that's a lovely thing to actually work with your body, where your body says, you know, I'm starting to feel full. Trust it. Walk away. 
people often worry that they might get hungry later. If you get hungry later, what can you do? Eat. It is worth knowing that it takes 60 days of no food to die. You will be all right if you're hungry for half an hour at some point later on tonight. Don't overeat now for what you think you might need later. Okay? And finally, would you stop trying to be perfect? I, you know, if we could shake that off, I think we would just do really well. You do not need to have perfect food to lose weight. Believe me, right? As a some, w woman with an addiction to Toblerone that's actually frightening, you don't need to be perfect to lose weight. Um, it's not about perfect. It's about being consistent, okay? It's about getting it right most of the time, 80% of the time. You know, because life is going to happen. Like, you'll have a bad day, and you will come home, and you will open the giant packet of crisps and eat the whole thing. But what you don't do is then spend the rest of the week doing that because you feel guilty because you did it the first time. Isn't it amazing how we punish ourselves by making ourselves fat? Have you done that? I've had one pack of crisps, so I might as well just eat the entire six-pack. Because, <laughs> like, that's really logical. <laughs> um, st stop yourself with that. And it's back, I think, a little bit to mental health as well. Be kind to yourself, be compassionate to yourself, and don't judge yourself. We have bad days. It happens. Get over it. Don't let it rule you. My mum went into hospital last year for three weeks, and she's fine, but she was in for three weeks, and during that three weeks, I was eating out of the hospital canteen and the vending machines and drinking more coffee than is good for any one person in a three-week period. Now, did I come out at the end of that and go, well, that's it, I am never eating healthy again? But how many of you have done that? We have a bad run, and we say, well, that's the end of it. And it's, we have this idea that we're useless or we're stupid or there's something wrong with us. We're just normal. So just come back. Stop beating yourself up with this idea of being perfect with your food. Get it right most of the time. And if you do that, you will actually find the weight follows. If you focus on your nutrition, the weight will follow. If you focus on portions, the weight will follow. So stop trying to be perfect. Stop giving out to yourself when you've had a bad day. It's quite normal. Just, you just pick up again when you can, and you carry on. Because to be honest, if you spend too much time trying to be perfect with your food, not only are you going to bore all of your friends to death, but you're going to miss out on the most important part of your food, which is enjoying it. This is my little son, who actually wasn't posing, he was just waving the spinach around going, what is it? Has <laughs> um, anybody any questions? Yeah, there's somebody down there. Hi, sorry. Um, just, can you eat too much protein? Because yeah, you can. I mean, it's kind of hard to do it because it, it tends to really satisfy the body quite a lot. Um, but what, you will find, what I find with where I'm seeing people eating a very high protein diets at the moment um, is sort of two things. When you eat that much protein, you edge out a lot of other important foods, which is the first problem. Um, now, if you really go for it and you have sensitive kidneys, you can damage the kidneys. Now, I've never seen it actually happen in practice, but I'm hearing about the theory of it all the time. My big concern with the high-protein diets, though, is that there's a disease that's very common in people as they get older called diverticular disease. Have any of you come across it? Yeah, very common in Ireland. And it's caused by lack of fiber sort of throughout a lifetime. And I would normally, and I mean, I'm a dietitian 20 years, and you'd be seeing people getting this late, si late 50s, early 60s is when people are diagnosed with it. But in the last two years, I, I have astonished the amount of people in their 30s coming into me with diverticular disease and the reason they have it is they've been on a high protein diet for three or four years and they just haven't brought in their fiber so to be honest you can eat plenty of protein but just don't nudge out the other really important foods and that's the, when we come back to nutrition we talk about balance it's so important to have a bit of everything with it and not to cut everything out so can I ask a quick one about kids portions just looking at the yeah. picture of your your beautiful son there uh, you know how much smaller should their meals be? Because I kn my son is eight and he, he can eat a lot. He seems to have a huge appetite. They don't need to be a huge amount smaller. I mean, if you look at someone, he's, he's six there. Um, he needs about 1,300 calories a day. Okay. So if you're looking at a woman who needs about 2,000, it's about 700, so about a third less, roughly. But that does also come down to how active they are. Yeah. As a rough guide, if you look at the palm of their hand, that's the size of the protein they need for their dinner. So same for us, palm of your hand. So meat, chicken, fish. So for a child, it's about the palm of their hand and then roughly the equivalent in carbs, okay. and then the rest should be veg, okay? So the days of giving your children big plates of pasta at the end of the day, and whoosh, that's a job done. So that's what you're looking at. Yeah. Okay, anyone, any questions? We've one down, the, yeah. Sorry, somebody just here. No, the white down the back there, sorry, behind you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. 
If you're training a lot, what sh should you eat more of, carbohydrates or protein? Um, to be honest, is it running? Uh, cycling, swimming. Cycling, carbs. Um, it's carbs that you want to add in because that's what you're burning for fuel. Now, you will, if you're doing a lot of cycling in the sense that you're building, trying to build muscle as well, you need a little more protein, but actually not a whole lot. Um, it's really fuel that you're going through with something like cycling. So it's carb, more carb foods um, that you're going to balance. So it'd be, the main thing to do would be to snack a little bit more if you're finding you're getting more hungry in between meals. Now, watch that as well because do go with your appetite a little bit. I've met lots of people who've started running and they're doing like a 5K, but they think they're doing a 25K and they're eating and they're taking the protein shakes and stuff like that. So go with your hunger a little bit as well, but it's carb snacks. So, but carbs isn't necessarily bread and stuff, like it's fruit, it's bananas, yogurts would actually count as well. Um, so they're good things to snack on if you need the additional food. Um, a little bit extra protein, but I wouldn't go much more than the palm of your hand at any meal um, with that. Thanks. Oh, okay, you have one there on the so edge there, yeah? Hi, how are you? I was just wondering what your thoughts were on sweeteners like aspartame um, and is it better to eat a little with real sugar rather than Sorry, I didn't yogurt? just catch the start of that. Sorry, what your thoughts were on sweeteners such as aspartame and... Sweeteners? I've no worries about sweeteners at all, actually. Um, it's a question that comes up an awful lot, but the, the science around sweeteners, um, we hear scare stories all the time, but if you actually go and read the studies, they're perfectly safe. And the European Union recently, just a uh, year and a half ago, they completed a massive review on aspartame. And they're actually going to go through all the sweeteners again, just because people are concerned, but they've reviewed it. And they went through the whole evidence, and I can send you the report, which is about that thick, on it. Um, perfectly safe. What you would have, there was a study that was out about seven or eight years ago, and they gave rats huge amounts of aspartame, and some of them developed liver cancer. So I think that's a lot of the panic we say causes cancer. But to put it into perspective, the amounts that they gave the rats, it would be the equivalent of drinking 20 cans of diet soda a day, every day for a year, to increase your risk of cancer by 1%. So it's in there, but I really, it, w it wouldn't concern me at all. Okay. There's a lady just Great. up here, can we? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting fit today. Hiya. Um, there's a lot of people in our chat room that get concerned when they do a lot of exercise that they tend to gain weight. And we're, we try to reassure them that sometimes it's normal. Can you maybe explain to people Absolutely. why it's normal to gain and weight after exercise? I think it frustrates the life out of so many people. They think mm -hmm. I'm dieting and I'm exercising and I'm actually putting on weight. When you train, especially if you go from being very unfit, you're going to start building muscle. Okay? Muscle is four times heavier than fat. Right, this is actually true. So even though you're burning fat, if you're gaining muscle, your weight will actually stay the same. But what you will see is you'll get thinner. You'll notice clothes getting mm. looser, and that's actually the thing to find. What you'll find is that it is very frustrating because the scales will not move. And I've seen, I remember having one patient, and I was saying to her, look, it's just because you're exercising. Right, she says, I'm stopping exercising. Like, no, it wasn't what I meant. Keep it going. It will actually eventually happen. Eventually, you're going to put on all the muscle you're going to put on, and then you will start to see the change in the scales. But that can actually take six months to a year. Okay? And you should know that. And especially if you do it really well, where you're exercising arms and abdomen and all your muscles, if you're doing something like swimming. Swimming in particular, you can expect to gain five pounds in the first two to three weeks that you swim. Okay? If you've gone from zero to swimming, just because it works every muscle on your body. But that's really good. Do you know we talk about having a faster, slow metabolism? Muscle is what decides how fast or how slow your metabolism is. The more muscle you have, the faster your metabolism. So when you get more muscle, you actually burn more calories just sitting there. Okay? So go for it. Build your muscle. People who are successful, not just at losing weight, but at keeping it off, build muscle. Not huge muscles, but you build it. So don't give up. If you're exercising and dieting, even if the scales isn't moving, if the clothes are getting loose, Okay, if you're noticing waistbands are a bit loose, your stuff is fitting you a bit better, you are burning fat, and that's absolutely perfect. Go with that. Okay, we're lady here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've had a conversation, just a couple of us, about um, people who are vegetarian and if you're trying to obviously substitute for meat proteins and um, one particular person in the group doesn't like eggs then as well, so that eliminates an awful lot of things that you can make stuff with. Would you have any suggestions how to... Well, protein for vegetarians, the, the place where they're going to end up then are beans and lentils will be the major thing that you're going to do. And really as vegetarian, they want to be having beans or lentils two to three times a day. Um, what I find with a lot of vegetarians is they have them once or twice a week. 
and then they come into me because their hair is falling out and stuff like that. So it's, it's beans, lentils and nuts. Be cautious with nuts because they are high in fat. So if that's your main place to get protein, you might struggle with weight. Um, but it's, it really is just bean dishes, hummus, stuff like that um, would be the main place you're going to go to get them. Okay. Great, we've won just a couple of rows. A row behind there, yeah. Hi. I know that you were talking more about the nutrition side. Now it's, it's okay to eat your dinner quite late. Um, I don't know if you can answer this question, but would it be the same for exercise? Because I find that if I have a late dinner, I end up doing um, a late uh, walking the dog. And then... To be honest, there's no... I, I would exercise whenever you can because I think life happens and we work and sometimes, you know, nine o'clock at night is the only time. The only, with exercise, it's really only if you do something like running late at night that you can be very high nearly after it. So you might not sleep for a while, but something like walking the dog, I wouldn't worry about um, with doing that. That should be fine. Hi, um, I have a, an immune disorder, the system thing, um, and I suffer from chronic fatigue. So is there anything that you would recommend? Because I'm doing the juices and the Nutri Bullet. Um, I'm taking the uh, maca powder in it because I find the tap, it's a bit hard to digest. So I just, it's, it's, it's hard, like it's yeah. very, very hard. You feel like you've been hit by a truck some days and you just need to close your eyes. But I'm working on it. Um, immune, once the immune system is involved, you do get very, very tired, and sometimes that is just a consequence of it, and there's not, unfortunately, a lot you can do about it. I would say, though, be careful with, I mean, the juicing is very good, but make sure you're not edging out other foods with that, because sometimes I'm seeing lots of people, now, I'm not saying you're doing it, but where they're, say, doing a juice diet, and they're just nothing but juice for seven days, but they've missed their iron, their protein, their zinc, and everything else as well, so... Carry on with what you're doing, but just make sure everything else is really well balanced. And with immune disorders, depending on what it is, sometimes fish oils and vitamin D can be useful as well, but it does depend particularly what's, what's going on with you um, for that. Okay, we can probably just take maybe two more questions. We have a lady here, yeah. Hi, I just wanted to find out if um, there was any food that would aid sleep. Like a very bad to sleep. Milk is the only one that mm. actually has I some good like studies. It. I know. Oh, um, no. <laughs> definitely, mil milk would be one to do. The other thing that aids sleep, um, I mean, there's not been studies on it, but I've used it a lot myself. Is a one called nighttime tea, which is a herbal tea. It's, you'll get it at any health food shop, which is quite good. Listen, just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why don't you you're going to have to drink something and just do it. I know. Um, if you're having trouble sleeping, though, physical activity is your absolute friend. Yeah. Um, sometimes, if you have kids, do you know how hard it is to get them to go to sleep if they're not actually physically tired? You know, maybe not enough you have kids or you don't remember. <laughs> Having two, like five and six year old, you need to wear them out. You need to wear yourself out as well. So if you're struggling with sleep, there can be lots of reasons for that. Um, but the food wise is milk and that nighttime tea would be the two. Okay. Um, Thank pinch you. your nose, get it down, you'll be grand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, any more? Or are we one just down the back there. You see one there. This will be our final question for Sarah. What do you recommend for um, recovery after exercise? Um, depends on what you've done. Um, and I'm not even been smart with this, but if someone's just gone for a walk, you don't need to be having sports drinks at the end of it, okay? <laughs> but if you've done something more intense, like if you've been running or something like that, to be honest, the studies at the moment that look at recovery foods, the very best thing that's coming out of it is a glass of skimmed milk. Um, they're finding that there's protein in that for muscle recovery, there's carbs in it, um, just naturally, the natural milk sugar, and then the, because of the other um, electrolytes in it, it's quite a good rehydration solution. So if it's running or uh, cycling, something like that, that's very, very good recovery. If you're very deliberately trying to build muscle, something with a little more protein in it can be useful, but it doesn't need to be a huge amount. And actually, again, milk seems to be one of the best for recovery. The whey that's in the milk has an amino acid in it called leucine, which is an important trigger for muscle building. So to be honest, it is worth eating something within 30 minutes of doing, say, aerobic exercise, because you'll get more energy back into the muscles. So we would often recommend a glass of milk, um, a sandwich, like a chicken sandwich, bit of protein, a bit of carb or something like that in there. Um, it really depends on when your next meal is. If you're going to have your dinner next, just go in and have it. But within about 30 minutes, a glass of milk and maybe a snack on something, yogurt that might have a bit of extra protein into it would be really good to go for. If you're doing kind of elite training, I'd actually go and talk to a good sports dietitian who'd give you very specific advice on, on carb amounts to have a look at that. Could you, would you even just, I know I said that was the last question, now I have one. Would you recommend that if somebody's training at maybe 7.30 at night, so they might have had their dinner at 4, 4.30, 
to have a chicken sandwich or milk. Not something that big. If you've kind of had your dinner okay. before you've gone out and you've done... Now, again, when I'm talking training, I'm like an hour or two at the gym or like yeah. a b- big run. I'm not saying you've walked the dog. Yeah, no. Um, but I would have a glass of milk there okay. more than anything else. The sandwich is maybe if you're doing it earlier in the day or you're doing a lot of training. You might need a bit more for that. Okay, thanks a million, Sarah. And just to echo something Sarah said in her presentation earlier on, that perfection is totally overrated. I don't know if any of you saw Brian O'Driscoll's tweet this week. Brian O'Driscoll (laughs) tweeted, not my finest moment, and underneath was the photograph of an entire packet of Cadbury's chocolate fingers, and he'd eaten all of them, (laughs) proving that even our former rugby captain, who's, you know, a professional athlete, you know, falls off every now and again and eats an entire packet of biscuits himself, so he's exactly like everyone else here today. It was quite a funny one to, to see. Anyway, thank you very much, Sarah. That was great. Thank you.